Well, good morning, Wednesday morning. We're back in the histories and we are at Joshua chapters 22 and 23. And this is actually the beginning of the last section of uh, the book of Joshua. Uh, next week, we will conclude it before we move on to the story that begins in Judges, which all starts to go terribly badly. Um, but, but already there's kind of hints of things maybe anticipated. Uh, and we'll come to see that as we move through this section, because when you pull back and think about the story of Joshua so far, it kind of breaks down into uh, four different sections. The, f- the first part, chapters one through four, is about entering into the land, the promises of God and taking hold of that. Then in chapters five through 12, you have the taking of the land, of the advances that actually established themselves into God's promised land. Then chapters 13 through 21, all the distribution, the possessing of the land as the people are now inhabiting God's provision for them in the promised land. And in these last chapters, 22 and 24, you have the retaining of the land. What will it mean for them to stay where they are? And into this section, there are three assemblies that are called, three kind of speeches given to the people of God. And In each of them, the common theme is the call for Israel to be faithful to Yahweh. Uh, That's because so far we've seen that that God has been faithful to Israel. Uh, We saw that at the end of chapter 21, didn't we, where it refers to all the things that God has done and not one of his promises falling to the ground. Every single one of them has been established. He has never failed. And now the call will come again and again. Will Israel be faithful to God? And of course, the book of Joshua, the book of Judges is the story that tells us that they are not. But for the lifetime of Joshua and for those that will follow him, the call is to this obedient faith that would come. And so Israel must respond in kind to the way that Yahweh has responded to them. Um, it's that song that we sing, love so amazing, love so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all, right? If God has responded to them in this way, then what does it look like to respond in kind? The God who's been faithful to respond with faithfulness. And so this is what we see. But of course, before that, we we actually hear of uh, the two and a half tribes being returned to the eastern side of the Jordan. They've, they've crossed the Jordan with all of God's people to fight alongside their brothers and sisters in order to establish them in the land. And now time has come for God to be faithful to his promise that they can return home to the eastern side of the Jordan. And in going, there's some interesting things that are said in that first half of chapter 22. One of the things that struck me was the way that... Um, it's recorded for us Joshua's commendation of the things that they have done. So in verses two through three, it talks about all or two through four. It talks about all the things that they have done and their obedience. And he commends them before he commands them. That's an interesting little pattern, that isn't it? Commendation before command. And in fact, you see the same pattern in Paul's letters where he'll commend a church often and then command them to respond. He'll tell them the wonderful things in terms of that God has done, established the gospel and how they have been faithful to that. And now here comes some stuff that they need to attend to. Same thing happens here. Two to four, they are commended for their faithfulness. And then in verse five comes the command. But be very careful to keep the commandment and the law that the Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commands, to hold fast to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all of your soul, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind. It sounds like a song, doesn't it? But that's the call, the command that comes after the commendation. And then what we discover is actually a a weird incident where they, they set off to return home and just before they do leave the promised land, they build an altar um, of, uh, of great stature in, in order to, well, it's not clear at first um, what it's all about, but when it's understood by those who have remained as to why this altar has been built, they're horrified. They're furious about the fact that another altar has been built because, well, it seems like they're overreacting, doesn't it? And maybe you kind of think, gosh, just get over yourselves. These guys are doing a good thing. Don't respond so harshly. But before you look to that, just stop for a moment and think about why the people of God were upset with the two and a half tribes building an altar where they did. And the reason is, is because it demonstrated perhaps a a diluting of the worship. 
there was to be one place where God was met and there was to be one people worshipping one God. You were to break down all of the Canaanite worship spaces. You, you weren't to have multiple places where you would go to worship. There is just one God and you worship him alone. And so this was actually a call to faithfulness, to unity and purity in the, the gospel that these people were following and holding on to. And that's a good reminder to us, I think, that, that, that we're called to this faithful pure response and not to dilute and see many diverse ways of worshipping God. But of course, they're wrong to respond in the way that they have, because actually what the people of God in building those altars were doing was actually trying to remind themselves of their fidelity to those who were worshipping God within the promised land. And so that it would be a constant reminder to them about their unity and purity. And of course, I think that's worth us being reminded of as well this morning that maybe we sometimes respond too fast. We rush to a fight rather than stopping to think about what is actually being communicated and said and listening for a moment. Uh, because actually the reverse was true. This call and this demonstration to unity. And so what chapter 22 declares for us is that it's actually when you get to the truth of the matter that unifies things. It's the very thing that Jesus says, that the unity is actually found in him being our head um, the unity that we find in one gospel that's proclaimed and one message that saves. Um, and that truth that we have is the thing that unifies us. And without uh, a, a unity of truth, there's, there's no unity. It's a false kind of unity. But thankfully, in this story, in chapter 22, they arrive very quickly and peacefully at a point of demonstrating unity where there could have been great division and bloodshed. But instead, they're drawn together. And then you move on to chapter 23 and just some brief thoughts here this morning. Here is uh, the second assembly, if you like, again, a call to the people to be faithful to the God who's been faithful to them. But it comes in the context of Joshua um, saying farewell. He knows that his death is looming and he's making preparations for when he is gone. And he sets before them a various kind of call to be alert for the long journey ahead. They've been faithful in the conquest, faithful to God. Will they continue day after day, year after year, into the generations that are to come? And that's what he's holding out to them. This call to vigilance, that they would take what they've received and pass it on to the next generation who will pass it on. And we all stand in the legacy of, of receiving that. And then think about what it might mean for you to take what you have received and pass it on to the next generation who will pass it on to the next. So... Think about that maybe today. Uh, are you part of that faithful legacy who's received this incredible gift that's to be passed on and preserved? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your justice and your mercy, that you are the faithful God that calls us to faithful obedience. I pray, Lord, that we would understand what it is that your Son has done for us, that as Jesus, the true and ultimate Joshua, led us into your promises and established for us peace with you. And you call us to faithful obedience, knowing, Lord, that you have indeed taken your wrath for our disobedience upon yourself, that you die in our place. We thank you for your loving kindness. And we ask, Lord, that as we look upon love that is so amazing, love that is so divine, that it demands my soul, my life, my all, and so, Lord, would you lead us in your ways today? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.